Our case this week was suggested to us by one of our own listeners. Rachel from Spotsylvania, Virginia, shared the story of Caitlin Akins, a 19-year-old who went missing over five years ago while visiting her family. On the day Caitlin was supposed to return back to her home in Arizona with her fiancé, her stepfather allegedly dropped her off at the airport, but Caitlin never arrived. For years, Caitlin's family and many Spotsylvania residents have wondered where their beloved daughter could be. Spotsylvania, or Spotsy as it's known to locals, is a small country area located between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia. Founded in 1721, Spotsy is covered in battleground sites from the Civil War and is full of American history. In fact, it's where General Stonewall Jackson, a famous Confederate soldier, was shot and killed during the Battle of Chancellorville. Spotsy is also the town where Caitlin Akins was born and raised. Born on September 2nd, 1996, Caitlin had the frizziest blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and was petite for her age. As a kid, her mom, Lisa Sullivan, would spend hours braiding Caitlin in her younger sister's hair, and this was something that the young girls loved. As she grew older, Caitlin would straighten her hair every morning because, as her mom always joked, if she went to bed with wet hair, she would wake up looking like a troll doll. Caitlin, through middle school and high school, wanted to be a Head Start teacher someone who worked with young children to help them succeed in school. This stemmed from having attended the Head Start program for low-income preschoolers when she was only four years old. According to Lisa, Caitlin loved kids, and they loved her too. Caitlin attended Riverbend High School in Spotsy for her freshman year, but eventually transferred to Caroline High School in 2011. There, she was able to graduate early when she was only 16 years old. After graduating, she worked at the local Wawa convenience store with her mom. Lisa was the manager for the night shift, and Caitlin would work in afternoons, running the cash register or working the deli. Outside of work, Caitlin loved Hello Kitty. Perhaps this was because she was allergic to real cats, and she loved getting tattoos and piercings. She actually had multiple tattoos, but most noticeable was the silhouette of five butterflies along her arm. Caitlin had been dating Amber Rios since 2014. Like with any small town, they had known each other since they were kids, and when Amber and her family moved to Arizona when she was 11, they stayed in touch and eventually started a relationship. When Caitlin finally turned 18 in September of 2014, she moved out to Arizona to be with Amber and soon after, they got engaged. For a year, Caitlin lived in Arizona happily with Amber, but when she found out about her sister having a baby boy, she knew she needed to visit home to meet her new nephew and to see her family. She was also about to start cosmetology school and needed to pick up a copy of her diploma from the high school. So on December 1st, 2015, 19-year-old Caitlin got on a plane back to Spotsylvania, Virginia for a short trip home. After spending a few days there, visiting friends, family, and her three-week-old baby nephew, Caitlin was ready to head back to Arizona. Her flight back was scheduled for 5.40 p.m. on December 5th. Caitlin, according to her mom, was excited to head back to Arizona to start cosmetology school. Since Lisa had to work at 10 a.m. that day, she said goodbye to her oldest daughter, dropped her off at James Branton's house, who agreed to take Caitlin to the airport. James is Caitlin's stepfather. Although he and Lisa had been divorced for some time, James had helped raise Caitlin and her sister Gabby, and despite the separation, everyone remained amicable. It wouldn't have been out of the ordinary for James to give Caitlin a ride to the airport, and he was willing to help. When Lisa dropped off Caitlin at 9.20 in the morning at James' house, which was about 80 miles from the airport in Partlow, Virginia, she noted that everyone seemed happy, 
chatting about future plans and catching up. Before she left, James told Lisa that he needed to be at work by 3 p.m. that day, so Caitlin would have to be dropped off a bit earlier than her scheduled flight. Lisa said that would be fine and said goodbye to her daughter for what would be the last time. According to Caitlin's cell phone records, at 11.56 a.m., the morning of her flight back, Amber Rios received a text saying, something came up, I'm not coming back today, I'll let you know when I get a new flight. And then a few moments later, another message came from Caitlin's phone to Amber saying, I won't be able to text for a bit. Amber was a bit concerned, but she tried not to think of this too much. Unaware that Amber had received messages from Caitlin saying that her plans had changed, at 1.52 p.m., Caitlin's mom heard from James Branton via text saying that he had dropped Caitlin off. The two had a brief talk about the traffic, but then James replied saying, I dropped her off at the Springfield Metro Station. She was going to take the Metro to the airport since there is a stop at Regan National Airport. According to James, Caitlin wanted to do a bit of shopping before getting on her flight. The Springfield Mall where James allegedly dropped her off was only a few stops by train from the airport. Immediately, Lisa was concerned. Caitlin hadn't taken the train since she was just a little girl, and she wouldn't know how it worked, and it seemed really out of character. Only a few minutes after exchanging texts with James around 2 p.m., Lisa received a text from her daughter. I'm at the airport, battery dying, so won't be able to text for a bit. Lisa then asked Caitlin to let her know when she had boarded, but got no reply. Concerned, but hoping everything was okay since she had heard from Caitlin, Lisa tried to carry on with her day, hoping that Caitlin would reply soon. But after a few hours with no word, she received a text from Amber who shared the contradictory messages she had received from Caitlin. As far as Lisa knew, Caitlin had gotten to the airport, but as far as Amber knew, she didn't. Amber, who was going to be picking up Caitlin at the other end of her flight, was worried about the lack of information and was hoping Lisa might know more. Lisa, who had assumed that Caitlin was on her flight, was now beginning to panic. At 7.15 p.m. on December 5th, nearly two hours after Caitlin's plane back to Arizona had departed, Lisa received two more texts from her daughter, or at least from her daughter's cell phone. Lisa had assumed that Caitlin was in the middle of her flight and wasn't expecting to hear from her. The first text read, I'm staying with a friend, and the second one, I need some time alone. Lisa knew something was off. I mean, this just wasn't like her. Why were her sentences so short? What was going on? Her mom noticed something was off because Caitlin was never the one to double text. She would always wait for your reply before sending that second message. And everything seemed fine just a few hours earlier when she was dropped off at James's house. So it was hard to understand what was going on. When Lisa replied, Call me, I'm very worried about you, please call me. Her usually responsive daughter never replied. And you can imagine how scary this would be. Your daughter is in another state, something seems off, and at this point, she's not answering her phone. Despite Lisa's persistent calling, Caitlin never answered or texted back. A little while later, Amber received her last message from Caitlin. I can't come back. I cheated on you. Despite calling and messaging, no more messages were heard from Caitlin again, and soon her phone stopped ringing altogether. With no new word from Caitlin, Lisa called the sheriff's office to report that her daughter was missing. The police were able to confirm the family's fears that Caitlin had never boarded her plane back to Arizona. And the following day, just as police were beginning their investigation, a road crew worker made a shocking discovery. All of Caitlin's luggage was found along a roadside ditch on River Road near Fredericksburg, an area 44 miles from the Springfield Metro Station. 
According to investigators, the luggage seemed as if it was thrown out of a moving vehicle, as the suitcase was damaged. There were scuff marks across it, and one wheel was missing. Inside the luggage was Caitlin's Arizona ID card, her wallet, which was still full of cash and credit cards, her phone charger, an old pair of glasses, and her used plane ticket from Arizona to Virginia. But oddly, none of Caitlin's clothes were found. The contents of the suitcase hadn't been scattered around, so where were all of her clothes? Also missing was Caitlin's high school diploma. According to her mom, her diploma was something Caitlin was really proud of, and it was especially important to her that she brought it back with her to Arizona. Lisa remembered Caitlin holding it as she arrived at her stepfather's. She and James had chatted about it and her upcoming plans. After finding Caitlin's things, but not Caitlin, Spotsy Sheriff Roger Harris knew that something was suspicious enough to warrant the police's full investigative effort. With her wallet and cash still there, police knew they weren't just looking at a robbery gone wrong. Her friends, family, and fiance didn't think that this is something that she would ever do. Police were hoping that someone had seen the luggage get thrown from the car, considering that the area where it was found was a highly trafficked area, the kind of road you don't want to be stuck on during rush hour. Now working under the assumption that foul play was involved in the disappearance of Caitlin Atkins, police began to look into her cell phone records and camera footage of the areas she was supposedly at on the last day she was seen. Their initial investigation showed that Caitlin's cell phone was never further north than Stafford, keeping her whereabouts in Fredericksburg in Spotsy, right in her hometown. They pulled video from the Springfield Metro Station, the airport, and other surrounding areas, but Caitlin never showed up in any of the footage. For investigators, their primary suspect quickly became James Branton the last person to have seen her alive, the man claiming that he dropped her off at the train station. But by December 9th, police reportedly cleared James as a suspect, saying that they were able to confirm his story, that he had indeed taken Caitlin to the Springfield Mall area. He continued to say that she asked to do some shopping before her flight, and that she would take the train into the airport, not finding that request odd at all. By December 12th, a week after Caitlin was last seen by her family, volunteers made up of family members, locals in the community, and the nonprofit organization Help Save the Next Girl handed out more than 3,000 flyers to people in Fredericksburg to help raise awareness about her disappearance and to encourage anyone who might have information about her whereabouts to come forward. But days turned into weeks. Police continued looking into phone records and any possible leads. Based on tracing the pings of Caitlin's phone off of cell towers, they learned that when Caitlin had allegedly messaged her mom that she was at the airport, her phone was nearly 30 miles away from there, in an area close to James's home. So if Caitlin had sent this message, it was a clear lie. And when James had messaged Lisa that he had just dropped off Caitlin, he was actually right near his home. The last messages sent from Caitlin's phone at 7.15 p.m. on the 5th pinged off of a cell phone tower only 15 miles from where her luggage would later be found. Her cell phone was never more than a short drive from James's house. At first, James Branton was absolutely cooperative with police. But after a year had passed and the police finally announced that they knew Caitlin's cell hadn't left the spotty Fredericksburg area, they asked James to tighten up the timeline he was providing. As more time went by, James refused to take a polygraph test or provide investigators with access to his Wi-Fi or cell phone passwords. Police also learned that though James had told his ex-wife that he had to drop off Caitlin early to get to work, he had actually called off that day. The official reason he gave as to why he didn't make it to work hasn't been released. 
in the years since Caitlin has been gone. Investigators have searched James's home, collected DNA samples, and confiscated personal items. While there's a lot of suspicion surrounding James, they haven't found anything to tie him directly to Caitlin's disappearance. Lisa and her family believe that he knows much more than he's sharing, but police have publicly cleared him as a suspect. In talking to Caitlin's friends to find possible info about what could have happened, one of her close friends came forward, Kevin Eastridge, her friend and former boyfriend alleged that Caitlin had told him that James had been abusive towards her when he was still married to her mom. Kevin wasn't exactly sure how abusive he was. Caitlin had shared enough for him to know that he was verbally abusive. Kevin also shared that on the night before Caitlin was going to head back to Arizona, she had met a friend and that friend's boyfriend. They had been drinking and the couple had forced themselves onto her. The three of them had sex, and then Caitlin, in a message to Kevin, wrote, I went to bed and cried. Though she had left in the morning feeling better and with no hard feelings towards her friends, Caitlin confided that she felt incredibly guilty for cheating on Amber and was deeply unhappy with her life. While some might see this as a motive for her to run away and start a new life, Kevin disagrees. Kevin told the press that despite what happened, Caitlin wasn't someone to just give up. She was always fighting. This makes us wonder who sent Caitlin's last message to Amber. I can't come back. I cheated on you. Some theorize that this was really from Caitlin, a confession of what happened that night before she ran away from her life. Others theorize that Caitlin had shared this information with James, and he used this information to explain away her absence. It seems likely that whoever took Caitlin had some knowledge of her life. How else would they have known to text Amber and Lisa, and about what had happened on the night before she was to leave town? In the five years since Caitlin was last seen, police have continued to follow leads and look for evidence, but nothing new has turned up. And there is no new evidence as to where Caitlin might be. Lisa wonders every day if she'll ever find her daughter alive, somewhere, living a new life, or if they'll only find her remains, buried and hidden away. The detectives in charge of her case have a far less optimistic outlook. Because Caitlin was a 19-year-old girl always on her phone with a close circle of friends that she talked to every day, it seems unlikely that she would just stop talking to everyone right away and that not a single friend would have any clue on what happened. To the police, it seems unlikely that she is still alive. Lisa and much of Caitlin's family continue to have a strong suspicion that James is involved in some way. In recent months, Lisa has put up a large billboard at a busy intersection right near her ex-husband's home. The sign is bright yellow, featuring Caitlin's face, and provides a phone number for anyone with information to call. Lisa hopes that James will come forward from guilt and finally help her and her family find Caitlin. In the meantime, she has continued to organize search parties to scour the area where her daughter's belongings were found and keeps up a Facebook page dedicated to finding Caitlin. Thank you so much to our listener, Rachel, for bringing our attention to this mystery. We are in awe of Lisa Sullivan and her family's commitment to finding Caitlin Akins and hope that with continued awareness brought to this case, someone will come forward with information that can bring closure to this heart-wrenching situation. For more information about Caitlin, head to facebook.com slash help find Caitlin Akins. And if you know any information related to this case, call the Spotsylvania Sheriff's Department at 540-582-7115. Thank you all so much for listening and we'll see you next week.